pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I would prefer to be in person. Uh, I think it's a whole lot better experience, uh, but we make the best with what we got in a COVID-19 world these days. And so we're going to talk about a topic that was almost sort of pushed to the back burner by COVID-19 in a lot of ways. Uh, glyphosate has, has been very controversial the last couple of years, especially. A lot of that kind of died down when COVID came around. Uh, but some recent actions and occurrences uh, via some settlements have sort of brought it back to the center of attention for a lot of people. And what we want to do today is talk about this controversy. Now, I want to start out uh, by saying, uh, number one, I'm not here to defend glyphosate. And, um, and number two, we're not here to defend any companies. And so we're going to talk science today. And we're going to talk about kind of the path that glyphosate has been on over the last several years and kind of how we got to where we are at. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And um, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end because there have been some really, really good questions already submitted. And we're very appreciative to you for that. And we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can uh, when we finish up uh, this part of the presentation. I'll be bringing in Dr. Jay Farrell, uh, my colleague, director for uh, the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants and the uh, IFAS uh, Pesticide Information Office. Uh, so we've, uh, we've got the heavy hitter with us today as, as we go through this. Okay, so here we go. What is glyphosate? So glyphosate is, a, is the, the, the name that we know very well these days, and it comes from uh, the product uh, that we often call Roundup. So Roundup has been around for a long time. Uh, the active ingredient in Roundup is glyphosate. Uh, it's pronounced glyphosate. And um, it is the world's most commonly used herbicide. So it has been around since the 1970s. It has had a uh, diversity of uses and uh, is now the world's most widely used herbicide. Now, why is it so common? How did it get there from uh, almost 50 years ago? Well, it has characteristics that have made it a very useful tool, primarily in agriculture and uh, certainly in non-crop type areas and, and in uh, horticultural situations in, in many instances. So you have to step back in history and think about where we were at in the 1970s. So we had come out of what I call probably the golden age of chemicals. And I don't mean that, that it was all great, but it was, you know, everything is good for you. And so we had a lot of pesticides on the market in the 1970s that uh, weren't that great. Uh, we had a lot of things that uh, were persistent uh, in the soil. We had things that had high degrees of toxicity. We had stinky, odorous things that stained. And here comes glyphosate uh, in, into the world of agriculture. And it was non-selective, meaning it controlled everything. And that was rare. It was non-volatile, uh, so it didn't uh, um, turn into a gas and uh, move off site. It didn't have an odor and it wasn't staining. And these were two big things in agriculture as a lot of pesticides then were very, very uh, stinky and, and staining. It didn't have soil carryover, uh, meaning you could uh, use it and plant crops uh, very quickly after that. And it was highly effective. So it had a number of characteristics that, that truly uh, caused it to be rapidly embraced by a lot of folks within the agricultural realm. It also was touted as having an excellent, excellent toxicological profile. So it was fully registered by the EPA. It had been through hundreds of toxicological tests, assessing both acute and chronic toxicity, environmental toxicity, and, and just a, a very, very broad spectrum of testing was done. And it really stood out in terms of its toxicological profile. Um, in aquatics, uh, that, I, that we do a lot of research here at the center, it's also utilized widely and has no restrictions on treated water for irrigation, recreation, or domestic purposes. So bottom line is it's one of the most widely used herbicides in natural areas and aquatics in the United States overall. Now, if we go back to a recent paper published in 2016, um, this was a, an analysis of the amount of glyphosate that the U.S. is currently using. And so this individual, Ben Brook, took data for, for glyphosate use from uh, our ag statistics and um, plotted that out over time. And what you can see, this red line here is total agricultural use. And you can see this almost linear trend in glyphosate use increasing uh, since 1992 to 2014. Now, what's kind of scary is this axis on the, the y-axis here. That's in millions of pounds applied. So what you can see is here by 2014, we had hit 250 million pounds of glyphosate applied on an annual basis in the U.S. Holy cow, that is a lot of glyphosate. 
Now, a lot of this was precipitated by the development of genetically modified crops, primarily Roundup Ready technologies that gave us Roundup Ready cropping systems such as, as uh, cotton, as soybeans, as corn. And so these were very rapidly embraced uh, by the agricultural sector. And so this resulted in a rapid shift to glyphosate or Roundup. And so a lot of farmers who weren't using a whole lot of glyphosate before 1996 suddenly started using a considerable amount more. And so very high percentages of a lot of uh, the crops are now Roundup ready and uh, have received glyphosate applications on an annual basis, oftentimes multiple glyphosate applications. So the question I posit to you is should we question? So should we at the University of Florida and IFAS as citizens, uh, as good caring citizens question and, you know, and, and push for the study of, of the use of this much glyphosate? And in IFAS we have one answer and that is absolutely. We will always advocate for better understanding uh, pesticides in the environment and our uses of pesticides uh, from both in uh, a production context and an environmental protection context. We take that very seriously. And so we will always advocate for more and better science. And as we learn things, we always want to be there, you know, on the cutting edge of saying, yeah, um, science is changing. We see something going on here. So we use a lot of glyphosate and we rely on it. And in the world of invasive plants, it's one of the primary tools that we utilize for things like invasive grasses. Um, we use it for uh, all kinds of things. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we killing ourselves in the process? So there have been at least three trials that have transpired over the last couple of years. All three of those, the juries ruled against the company. Uh, initially it was Monsanto and uh, during this process, the company Bayer uh, bought Monsanto, and so now we talk about Bayer being tied up in these lawsuits. But juries have awarded 289 million, 80 million, over two billion dollars, two and a quarter billion dollars total, essentially over that, um, to uh, plaintiffs who allege that glyphosate caused their cancer, primarily non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, cancer is a horrible, horrible thing, and it's a very emotional issue for a lot of people, and we all can relate to it very strongly. Probably not a person on this webinar today doesn't have direct relationship or friendship with someone, a close acquaintance, a family member who has battled cancer at some point. So cancer uh, across the board is, is, is something that we all really relate to and struggle with. <clears throat> so how did we get here? How did we get from literally the safest herbicide to use to over 125,000 lawsuits lined up against Bayer uh, Monsanto and uh, regarding Roundup. Um, so how do we get there? So we're going to quickly go through the story of how we got there so you can understand um, and you'll learn in this talk that semantics are everything. It's very important in terms of the terminology that's bandied about and what's utilized. And so I want you to see that as we go through this so you'll better understand what's going on here. So back in March of 2015, so we're going on five years out now, somebody called the IARC, a subgroup of the World Health Organization, reclassified glyphosate as probably carcinogenic. Now this was immediately picked up by a lot of the major uh, um, news organizations, and here's the New York Times report that the WHO report links ingredient in Roundup to cancer, and they were specifying glyphosate in this case. Okay, so this kind of sent some shockwaves around the world, and I don't know if anybody really knew what was to come, um, but a lot began to transpire after this initial reclassification of glyphosate. So the first thing you're going to ask them, well, who in the world is the IARC? Are they some fly-by-night radical environmental group that uh, that that sort of hates chemicals and, and is doing everything they can to ban all pesticides? And the answer there is no. The IRC is called the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And it is a highly credible scientific body in the world today. And you can go to their website um, and they have a tremendous amount of information that is very transparent now regarding who they are and what they do. And their mission is to conduct and coordinate research into the causes of cancer and they collect and publish surveillance data regarding occurrences of cancer worldwide. So the IRC has been around for essentially 50 years now, and they were founded with a mission. They were tasked by the WHO to literally come up with lists of things that would be known carcinogens. 
Now, if you're the World Health Organization working in a lot of countries all over the place, and you're sending people potentially into harm's way, you really want to have a pretty good handle on exactly what might be causing cancer so you are not putting your own people at risk when you send them into uh, you know, certain countries. So very good intentions, very good mission. They have classified over a thousand different uh, compounds and activities now regarding carcinogenicity or, or the ability to cause cancer. So there are 127 monographs that they have now published uh, regarding uh, this over a thousand different substances and activities. Now I can tell you, if you want some bedtime reading, if you have insomnia, this is the place to go because it is extremely detailed, very dense scientific writing regarding assessment of different things for carcinogenicity. Okay, so this is online. You can Google IRC and go straight to the website to their monographs. They have essentially four different groups. Group one, these are things that are known carcinogens uh, to humans. Group 2A, which are things they have deemed to be probably carcinogenic to humans. And then uh, group 2B, possibly carcinogenic. And group three, not classifiable in terms of carcinogenicity to humans. So you can see the numbers there from 121 agents in group one, 88 and two, 313 2B and 499 in group three. So they, uh, they really uh, have taken it upon themselves to, to really assess a whole lot of things over the last 50 years. And this is no, no small task. It is a tremendous effort. If you go to IARC, I strongly encourage you to get into the preamble document because this provides you with a whole lot of background and understanding about the way they operate. And I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit, but overall, I strongly encourage you go there um, and read this before you uh, read too much into anything uh, that, that you learn about IARC, and it will help you out tremendously, okay? And they even say there on that page, it is strongly recommended um, to basically uh, go to the preamble. Okay, so what do they mean? What does IARC mean by probable carcinogen? Because that's a scary term to a lot of us. First off, probable doesn't mean known carcinogen. This is where the media has gotten it wrong about 99% of the time in that they take IARC's 2A classification and state it as if it was a um, one, category one classification of known carcinogens. So unfortunately that has prompted a lot of misinformation on social media and online um, and in a lot of reputable news organizations that glyphosate is a carcinogen. And that's simply not what IARC has done here. So probable doesn't mean known carcinogen. It actually doesn't even mean likely carcinogen, okay? So likely is still scary, but um, something that's like that, that would almost inevitably cause cancer, but that's not what it means either. They have a specific definition and they have three different components and two out of the three are required uh, to really state this as a probable carcinogen. Number one, there's limited evidence of carcinogenicity in humans. That means out of all the open source peer reviewed studies that they looked at, they found limited evidence that uh, glyphosate would cause cancer in humans. The second one, there's sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in experimental animals, which means, again, reviewing the open source peer-reviewed literature, they found some sufficient, sufficient evidence, uh, according to their standards, that glyphosate causes cancer in experimental animals, okay? And there's a third one here that can be utilized if one of the first two is not met, and that is strong evidence that the agents the agent exhibits key characteristics of carcinogens. So that's an interesting um, third component here because as you can see, it is like something that is similar to, has properties uh, exhibited of, you know, but not necessarily any scientific evidence uh, directly linking it to carcinogenicity, okay? So this is why it is in this category of probable carcinogen. So I want you to understand these things. So this is exactly what it means when IARC has reclassified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. Limited evidence in humans, sufficient in experimental animals, and strong evidence um, of, that exhibits characteristics of carcinogens. And with glyphosate, they met two of these characteristics at least. Now, let's step back a minute. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency who regulates pesticide labeling and um, here in the United States has weighed in on this issue. The EPA uh, provided the initial registration for 
uh, glyphosate way back in the late 70s. It has reviewed glyphosate and re-reviewed glyphosate multiple times now, looking at all the available literature and data it can, it can get its hands on. And it basically has come to the conclusion that glyphosate is not likely to be a human carcinogen, okay? So the EPA, the regulatory authority here in the United States, the regulatory scientific authority, has said, no, we disagree with the IERC, glyphosate, the evidence is not there to say glyphosate causes cancer, okay? Now, um, they have also moved forward with uh, reviewing and re-reviewing this document, and this is available on their website. You can Google EPA glyphosate review and um, actually get the entire uh, review and the process and the entire literature review that they utilized to assess the safety and the toxicology of glyphosate. So they have, uh, they have done this, and recently, as recent as April 30th, 2019, um, they moved that forward. Now, the European Union also disagrees with the IARC, okay? And so basically, they have concluded glyphosate is unlikely to pose carcinogenic hazard to humans, saying, stating a lack of evidence, okay? <laughs> a number of countries around the world, Canada, Australia, South Korea, France, Germany, Switzerland, Brazil, Japan, New Zealand, all disagree with the IARC. So what's going on here? You have a credible scientific body, the IARC, who has stated one thing regarding carcinogenicity and a, essentially m almost most of the countries around the world who have pesticide regulatory bodies have said, no, we disagree with you. So why is it that, is it the IARC against the world? What's going on here? Why are the IARC and the EPA at odds. So let's start there, okay? So this is really important, and this is where I got into semantics. IARC assesses something that we call hazard, okay? Is harm possible is what hazard means. So what is the potential to cause harm regardless of dose or exposure? So they get, they utilize a hazard approach in their assessments because the World Health Organization is looking to identify carcinogens even when risks are very low at the current exposure levels because near unforeseen exposures could engender risks that are significantly higher. So again, you've got to accept that the WHO has taken a relatively good approach here and a very conservative approach to tasking IARC to take a hazard um, approach in their assessments. So again, I don't find fault with that at all. All right, now let's compare that to what the EPA does. The EPA assesses risk. And what they mean by risk is, is harm likely? And more specifically, what is the likelihood that this will cause harm based upon dose and exposure? So you can see that risk has two components there, dose, so the amount of, of a, a substance, and exposure, or the, the length of time that you may be exposed to that substance. So all of the EPA's assessments are, are risk assessments, looking at both dose and exposure, which is very different from the hazard approach. So right here, you can immediately see that essentially the two conclusions they're coming to are apples and oranges. One is assessing hazard, is harm possible? One is assessing risk, is harm likely based on dose and exposure, all right? Now, because they assess hazard, IARC has a high hit rate. And the IARC also specifically targets things they're concerned about because they're tasked with doing that. Okay, so again, I'm defending them here a little bit. Um, and over four decades, uh, basically the IARC, and in this case, back when this article in Reuters was published, it was 989 substances ranging from arsenic to hairdressing, found only one was probably not likely to cause cancer. And uh, that was an ingredient used in ni of nylon and stretchy yoga pants and toothbrush bristles. So the bottom line is they have a high hit rate because they are actually looking for things uh, where there's smoke, there's, there may be fire and they're looking for smoke. Okay, now, so now that we've separated out what we mean by hazard and risk, let's look at what the IARC has classified as other probable carcinogens and some actually known category one carcinogens. So this is the group one um, this is a few of the 121 total, and many of them have very long, complex chemical names because it, it's clear we have a lot of chemicals out there that are carcinogenic. But here's some things you might relate to a little bit better. Alcoholic beverages, asbestos, tobacco and opium smoking, plutonium, direct solar radiation and UV tanning beds, wood and leather dust, ionizing radiation, and yes, 
you heard it here, processed meats like bacon, okay? Now, a number of you probably just completely discounted the IRC based upon that bacon there, because who's ready to give up eating bacon if you're a bacon fanatic? Um, now, let's look at some probable carcinogens. Now again, they have put glyphosate on this list of 2A probable carcinogens. Creosote, so the thing we put on power poles, malathion insecticide, one of the wide, most widely used uh, residential insecticides. Um, hair products, so worker exposure, people who work in salons have a higher incidence of cancer, and so they declare um, basically hair care products as probable carcinogens. Red meat consumption, and we already put bacon on there, now we're adding red meat to it. Beverages greater than 149 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not making these up. This is on the probable carcinogen list, and you can go and look at these things. So basically, if you drink a couple of hot cups of coffee a day, then you are actually increasing your probability of esophageal cancer. And there's really good data worldwide. It's not just coffee. Pretty much any hot drinks above 149 consumed repeatedly. Uh, turns out our esophagus just doesn't like to be doused in really hot liquids over and over all day long. So if you're ready to give up coffee, I'm actually not. Um, but, I, <laughs> but, uh, but it is a fundamental reality. A lot of folks like their coffee extremely hot. And finally, shift work. If you participate in shift work, and a lot of folks do, circadian rhythms, disrupting that has actually been linked to uh, uh, I, by ARC as a probable carcinogen. It turns out our bodies don't like that very much. So you can see these two lists. Um, really, there's, there's some really powerful things on there like plutonium. Then there's some things that, that we accept on a daily basis within our lives that are not only known carcinogens and also probable carcinogens. So if you step back and pause and reflect, and oh, and by the way, cell phones can be uh, thrown on there too. I think cell phones make the list of probable carcinogens. So um, if, you, you know, if you step back and think about the level of risk you are willing to accept in your own life, you can see that IARC is touching on some things that hit very close to home. Frying emissions, um, you know, this is uh, this one. This one just uh, drives people crazy. But the reality is that uh, the um, emissions from a frying pan, from oils frying cooking food, actually, they classify as a probable carcinogen. Okay, so I show you these things not to discredit IRC. I feel like I've spent a lot of time defending them, but I'm trying to give you some context regarding some of the things that are on the list that they have moved glyphosate into. Okay, all right. Now you may not have any trouble with that list at all, and that's okay. And I, and I'm not showing it to scare anybody, but I'm showing it to, to lay out the risk that we accept daily. Now, there was some really big controversy that occurred uh, over some, some study data that was not included within this, and this was the Agricultural Health Study. So the AHS study is one of the largest pesticide applicator studies utilizing a cohort of over 50,000 pesticide applicators that they follow for decades. They send out questionnaires every few years, they get their responses back, they look at the health records of all these people, and they do every possible statistical analysis they can to look for any asso associations of any cancers with the pesticide use. And what they found in this study is um, no association apparent between glyphosate and any solid tumors or lymphoid malignancies overall, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and its subtypes. So basically the Ag Health study right now, according to the data collected, has not found any association. And this data was not considered by um, the IARC because at the time it was unpublished data and the IARC cannot look at unpublished data. It's one of the prerequisites. This study has subsequently been published and there have been many calls for the IARC to reevaluate glyphosate. That's not happened to date. I will point out this very bottom line here, there was some evidence of increased risk of AML types among the highest exposed group that requires confirmation. So even within AHS, AHS study, they are still saying, this is something we need to study a little bit more. We don't have solid data yet, but take it seriously, okay? So then what happened, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, two years later, proposes a warning label under what is known as Proposition 65. So if you know anything about Prop 65, if you've ever lived in California, this is the thing that puts the warning labels on pretty much everything in California these days. So we see a lot of these labels, and this is not a joke, this is serious. Prop 65 has been around since the 80s, 
and it was designed to protect consumers from cancer-causing substances. So you'll see signs on uh, tags on a lot of products, you'll see warning labels around California, and some people would argue it's almost become excessive so that the entire state is one big Prop 65 label. Um, but I will argue that it does have merit and uh, Prop Proposition 65 is not, you know, a bogus type thing. Okay, so California courts immediately blocked that Prop 65 warning label and the judge in that case basically stated that it was impossible for consumers to make uh, a good choice based upon the, the, the contrary uh, or the lack of evidence associated with overall uh, with the EPA's assessment and others on glyphosate and, and a link to carcinogenicity. The EPA kind of doubled down on this and has actually moved to block California's Roundup cancer warning saying that the state absolutely cannot put a cancer warning label on Roundup because the data says there is no link uh, between glyphosate and cancer. So here you have the EPA, um, a federal entity now going against one of the most powerful states in the country. So how long and how long do you think that's going to be tied up in the courts? Probably a while. So with all this being said, why are juries, why did these three juries go against Monsanto and Bayer? So why is it that three juries have ruled against um, the companies, given the discussion that I have just given you regarding these concepts of what the IERC has done, what, and the way the EPA and other pesticide regulatory authorities assess uh, pesticide risk? So what's going on here? Well, we weren't in the courtroom, so we really can't comment on the specifics of what happened or was said within any of these courtrooms. We were not on the jury, and so it's very reckless for us to sort of certainly attack, especially the plaintiffs, uh, all three of which are suffering from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so we can't really go down that road. We could say, you might say there was a lot of emotion involved. It's a cancer issue. You could say a large corporation's involved. Um, one of the things, though, that came out, and, uh, and you saw this in a lot of different media outlets, was that there was something called the Monsanto Papers. And according to court documents, there was some evidence that Monsanto employees at the time were ghostwriting articles minimizing cancer concerns. And this was really highlighted within the trials, and, um, and it actually cast a big shadow of doubt that you had an evil corporation um, secretly writing documents to, to negate cancer concerns. So a number of agencies actually reviewed those ghost uh, documents, the Monsanto papers, and, uh, and they uh, reviewed them and they took a real hard look at them. And the bottom line is the European Food Safety Authority basically said, look, even if these allegations are true, it was two documents and they would not have impacted our assessment as presented in the uh, conclusion on glyphosate. So it was two papers out of approximately 700 scientific references in the area of mammalian toxicology uh, considered in their glyphosate assessment. So I'm not, I'm not uh, saying it's okay. If Monsanto folks were doing that, then, sh then not just shame on them, but prosecute them to the full extent of the law. Okay, that is totally unacceptable to be doing that type of thing. And I disagree with it highly. But what I'm saying here is that the pesticide regulatory authorities who have looked at this issue have basically concluded that those documents did not influence what their final assessments were on glyphosate. So what seems to be happening across the three trials is something like this, that there is a big company that is knowingly marketing a defective product and has covered it up. And this, uh, this, and that the science of glyphosate safety has not been one of the main drivers in these cases, as there's been a number of scientific studies that judges have denied uh, as admissible evidence in this case or in these cases. So there's this very strange thing going on here of going after a company based upon a faulty product, but not considering a lot of the science associated with the safety of that product. The high punitive damages, the punishment damages seem to reflect this. So awarding over 2 billion, awarding over a quarter of a, a mil, uh, $250 million um, definitely seem to reflect that the juries certainly felt like they were sending a message to the big company saying, hey, you're not playing above, uh, above on the level here, and we're going to punish you for this. Okay, so where are we headed here? And I'm going to be wrapping this up pretty soon, so we have time for questions. So, you know, where are we at with glyphosate now that these things have transpired? Well, we've actually had a number of cities or counties 
uh, here within Florida that have actually banned the use of glyphosate. Now this doesn't mean private individuals can't use it, but it does mean that any public employees who work for those um, government entities uh, do, can no longer use glyphosate. Martin County, Stewart, Miami, and there's been several more. And this is not just a few instances, okay? Glyphosate's been banned in over 150 U.S. cities to date. Several countries across the world uh, have also proposed or are attempting to move towards glyphosate phase-outs over the next few years. Now, some of those countries, like Germany and France, um, disagree with the IARC in terms of their pesticide regulatory authority, but the leadership in the country is still moving forward on a ban of glyphosate. So there's disagreement that is occurring all over the place. Um, and, the, and even in the light of what the regulatory authorities for pesticides are saying versus uh, the overall governmental leadership, which is pushing for a ban, okay? So that's why you tend to see such highlights um, moving across social media and across news media outlets on countries that are attempting to do this. So you may have read recently Mexico attempted this, got in a huge, huge internal battle within their government. Uh, they backed off of it uh, and um, people resigned from government. You know, this, this type of thing is happening over and over. Austria moved to ban it. The EU blocked them. Uh, there's, there's just all kinds of things like that that are occurring with massive internal conflicts in many countries across the globe right now. So this is a really hot topic issue. Insurance uh, has become an issue too. Companies like Harrell's who discontinued the use uh, and distribution of glyphosate products stated they did it not because of the science of glyphosate safety, but because they were informed by their insurers that they would no longer cover them if they continued to sell glyphosate. So this could become a bigger issue than even the current lawsuits if, in, if insurers started opting out of covering people who were using, selling, or dealing with glyphosate. All right, now to stir the pot or make matters uh, even crazier, Bayer reached a point of facing over 125,000 claims that they have officially begun settling cases. So the New York Times headline recently ran, Roundup Maker to pay 10 billion to settle cancer suits. So basically somewhere between 10.1 and 10.9 billion dollars in total, almost 10 of that for current claims, a billion and a quarter for class action and future issues, and three appeal cases are not covered. So those three that I mentioned before are not part of this. So, so Bayer, you might ask the question, why is Bayer doing this? Well, it turns out it's very expensive to litigate and at a cost of over $3 million a trial. Uh, when you do the numbers uh, for 125,000 potential trials versus 3 million bucks a trial, $10 billion actually comes out on the cheap side. So uh, corporately, you know, we don't know all of their thinking on that, and it's really not our business, uh, but the bottom line is they decided to settle. Now, um, what does this mean for us in IFAS, okay? So number one is this settlement and admission of guilt by the companies that they did something wrong, and we have to say that we don't have that admission of guilt just from these settlements. So Bayer hasn't come out and said, yeah, we admit it, we lied, you know, the office that causes cancer all along, we're gonna pay everybody. That's never, never happened. So basically the settlement is not an admission of guilt. The settlement is a large corporation moving forward to try to get this thing off their backs. So um, basically it's not finalized. So whatever you read regarding these settlements, I would say we're still a long way from seeing the end of the litigation regarding glyphosate. Now I don't expect it to end anytime soon, even though I suspect the company would love for that to happen. Okay, so what is our position at UF? Now UF has always said we stand by the science, that we wanna be data-based in everything that we do and recommend. And so we've come out with some pretty strong statements on that. Number one, we're committed to IPM. Integrated pest management is the first line of defense against weeds and other pests. And that's basically using a, a, a really good comprehensive strategy of all the tools in the toolbox, not overly relying on chemicals, recognizing there may be a place for the use of safe and effective use of chemicals in some situations, along with other pesticides, but certainly not leaning on them as a crutch and being solely dependent on glyphosate. All right, so all reasonable options in concert to control pests. And we have to stand on that because we believe that the paradigm in science driving integrated pest management is where we need to be based upon good data. So we have produced a one page on this that kind of discusses this a little bit more in light of the settlements that have occurred. Um, and we can make this available to you. We'll, we'll get a link for it and put that in the notes here uh, before we finish up. 
Okay, so let's wrap up real quickly here. What are some of the other options without glyphosate? So this is a very diverse audience that you know could include a lot of different people. I cannot be comprehensive. This is its own seminar, you know. But when you think about um, the places that we use glyphosate and remove weeds, hand removal is a great option. And I advocate for hand removal everywhere that it's feasible. Okay, it's highly selective. It has good public perception. It's got its cons. Time. Costs are typically much higher for hand weeding, often five times the cost of chemical strategies. Finding a disposal for all of this biomass can be problematic. Uh, oftentimes, if you can compost it or get it into um, yard waste type facilities, uh, then good for you and go for it. Perennial weeds are often very difficult because they tend to break off and re-sprout. Things like torpedo grass that have these long creeping stems, you pull the shoots, these break off and it re-sprouts at every single node after that. So we struggle and uh, in very dry situations, rocky situations, heavy clay soils, hand weeding is extremely difficult. We get lucky here in Florida because we have sandy soils that are often moist where hand weeding is probably the easiest place in the world to do uh, compared to other dry, hard, heavy clay soils. All right, mulch. Mulch is the cornerstone of weed control programs for a lot of situations. Mulch depth and type actually do matter. Dr. Chris Marble has done some fantastic research at Apopka, uh, looking at coarse textured mulches that really do a good job at suppressing annual seed germination. Um, they do work better on annuals than perennials. Fine textured mulches can actually promote weed growth because they hold water and encourage weed seed germination from within the mulch layer. So, um, so you've really got to you got to think about this and, and pay attention on your mulch. Depths of greater than an inch blocks the light necessary for a lot of weed seed germination, and two inches creates a greater physical barrier. So we recommend at least two inches of mulch in most cases. And pine bark has overall provided better weed control than a lot of hardwood mulches, which hold more water. Regardless, it's not a silver bullet, and mulch you know will age and must be replaced regularly. It decomposes relatively quickly here in Florida. Um, we have herbicide alternative documents. We produce several of these, a couple here in Florida for uh, weed control in Florida landscape and planting beds. Uh, Integrated Management of Non-Native Plants and Natural Areas of Florida has a number of glyphosate alternatives uh, for all sorts of invasive plants. We have other documents that do also provide a lot of other herbicide recommendations. I can't give you an exhaustive list today, but in IPAS we have been working on this for a long time now. Now, what about natural alternatives? And, and you know, um, Shelley asked the question early on, what about things like glyphosate or as, a, as an alternative to glyphosate? And a lot of people posted vinegar uh, within that. So there are products uh, where, vinegar is, uh, um, where vinegar is the active ingredient as a contact style herbicide. So vinegar, yes, vinegar can be a, um, an effective uh, burn down type strategy for a number of very small annual weeds. You may also have seen something like uh, this, a common online homemade remedy of a half gallon of vinegar, a half cup of salt, and two tablespoons of dish soap. What I want to say about this is it is chemical. This is not a non-chemical strategy. Vinegar is acetic acid, sodium chloride is salt, and, and dish soap that you add to it is simply a surfactant that helps uh, enhance um, the spreading of that mixture across the leaves themselves. So this is a homemade herbicide type solution that a lot of people tout as a, as a safe and effective. So here's what I'll say about it. It's a contact type treatment, so it's gonna desiccate and burn exactly the foliage that it touches. It will not translocate to the roots. It only provides contact activity. It's really good on a lot of small annual weeds, and a lot of people stand by this and utilize it, and that's fine. Uh, it's extremely high volumes in a soil drench. You might have some contact activity on fine roots, uncertain on rhizomes. Um, but uh, really typically very weak on perennials. It's also not approved for commercial use. So this is not something you can just in your business rotate towards uh, to utilize, um, but it can be an effective home remedy. And so if you've tried this and, and are happy with it, go for it. It's, it's not a bad thing at all. So with that, uh, I'd like to stop here and answer questions. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention today. I hope we've been able to provide some clarification kind of on really what the status of glyphosate is, explaining the terminology that's been used to classify it as a probable carcinogen, explain how the EPA differs from the IARC, and kind of just really show you where we're at. So we're not advocating for you, to, we're not telling you to use glyphosate. If you don't want to use it, that's absolutely fine. 
And we pay attention to the science of glyphosate safety and as, it, and as studies move forward, if we begin to see the needle move, questioning its safety, then we will by all means be the first one waving the flag saying, hey, we got a problem here. We need to cease using glyphosate until we better understand this. But as always, read and follow every pesticide label. Do not take glyphosate likely. If you're gonna use it, take it seriously, follow the label, use all appropriate PPE, and do not abuse it as a pesticide product. Be very careful with it. Take it seriously if you choose to use it. And if you don't, more power to you. Um, and, and, and we strongly advocate and encourage for alternatives to glyphosate, uh, you know, along with uh, as IPM type alternatives. Okay, so with that, let's uh, move to the questions. All right, so I'm going to now go back and call up the uh, text box here. Let me see, I'm gonna stop the share of the screen. Okay, so let's go back to the chat. And my gosh, we have like 72 questions here. Okay, so this is a tremendous amount. Now I'm gonna bring Dr. Farrell in on this. And um, Shelly, how do you recommend we move about, uh, go through this, let's see. In the chat section, we have a lot of people who are recommending some things. So I see salt, I see vinegar, Epsom salt soap, which we talked about. I see mulch, excellent. One here I see is bleach. Okay, so um, if you are choosing to use bleach as an alternative or as an herbicide type, I strongly encourage you to be very, very careful. And I really don't even advocate or recommend the use of bleach. Bleach is exceedingly dangerous. Um, what we know about it is if you get it in your eyes, uh, I mean, it, it can literally cause a loss of vision very rapidly. If you were to ingest it or, or children were to ingest it, we know that that is extremely dangerous and potentially lethal. So be very careful if you are taking the bleach approach. We don't advocate that one at all, and we don't have good data on many species for bleach. Flaming, absolutely an excellent um, opportunity. There's a lot of good flamers in agricultural systems these days. We lack good flamers for a lot of other pest management, uh, weed management systems, but we have it in ag. Black plastic, uh, absolutely. Um, um, basically utilizing uh, our high summer temperatures with intense sunlight to sort of cook anything below black plastic um, definitely has been effective for some weed species and so that's a nice alternative hand pulling absolutely pruning and clipping sure you can remove those that's a good idea just know that there's likely to be some regrowth if you got goats goats can be a fantastic form of weed control especially in a, in a lot of pasture and non-crop type areas Soil sterilization, that's sort of coming back to soil solarization, utilizing uh, uh, plastics to cover prescribed fire. We use prescribed fire in as many natural ecosystems, sometimes in pastures, and uh, it can be a good IPM tool. We advocate for that. Corn gluten meal is an interesting one um, as a great alternative. Uh, I don't have a lot of great data with CGM. Uh, other researchers have found it can be effective. It often requires some pretty high application volumes, it species, it and it varies by species tremendously. Um, okay, so scrolling on through these, I see lots more of those. Um, neem oil, so there's a few different oil type products that are on the market. Um, neem is one. Um, there's a couple of others, there's sargassum, eugenol was another. These things are often, they're, very, they're contact type materials. And so they're not gonna translocate to the roots, but they can provide burn down of typically very small annual species. Um, going on through these, okay, how often is multiple applications for commercial crops? Um, you know, depending upon the cropping system, two to three applications, typically two applications of glyphosate. Uh, for a number of cropping systems on an annual basis. Uh, membership and IRC determined. Um, so they are, they are invited and I don't have the formal uh, process by which that occurs, um, but, but IRC uh, very selectively scrutinizes those uh, scientists. They are highly reputable and uh, have a long track record of uh, typically toxicology. Um, yes, we will be happy to share a copy of the seminar. Key characteristics of a carcinogen. So basically what that's coming down to are a very broad range of things from known carcinogens that they would put into those categories. So like ionizing radiation would be, would be a key characteristic for radioactive substances that they are uh, of known carcinogens. 
um, Roundup banned here in Canada. Um, so I'd have to look at the uh, at exactly. I do not believe Roundup has been banned in Canada at this point. Um, Canada has much more stringent pesticide laws than the U.S. does, so there may be more limitations to it. Okay, hot coffee, definitely over 149. You better believe it. That's why we advocate for cold brews, too. I love a good cold brew. Um, hot tea, yeah, you just got to be careful with it. Um, small town, central Florida, uh, drainage ditches are a major problem. So spraying with glyphosate. Okay, so a lot of towns have utilized glyphosate for ditch spraying. And I'll be the first to say that there's room for improvement in a lot of cases for ditch vegetation management. Um, glyphosate's been one of the cheaper ways they do it. Um, it is a major struggle. Things are rapidly growing back on those ditch banks all the time. And they are required to maintain those ditch banks that way so that they can keep flow in those ditches to prevent flooding. That is a flood control issue. So um, I agree with you that putting lots and lots of chemicals into the environment is a problem. Um, and it can become a problem. Um, and there is some work to be done there on improving ditch bank type control. Uh, hot chocolate and meat, yeah, those are on there. Processed meat, red meat, yeah, okay. Um, what about glyphosate causing phosphorus pollution, adding nutrients leading to water degradation? So some of the studies that are out there in extremely nutrient poor lake systems, glyphosate has been shown to bump the phosphorus slightly. It is 18% phosphorus by weight. Um, but, uh, but in Florida, our, most of our lakes are already eutrophic and a lot of those are naturally eutrophic, meaning they're already high in nutrients, phosphorus being one of the primary nutrients. So the amount of herb glyphosate added, um, we, only, we don't spray it directly into the water. It's only used to treat floating or emergent vegetation. And so the concentration of the amount of phosphorus moving into Florida lakes based upon a glyphosate application is almost negligible. Um, compared to uh, very oligotrophic or nutrient poor systems. Um, many cities have banned glyphosate, simply gone to using a different synthetic chemical. What implications do you foresee with this? Excellent question. So with Diquat, Diquat's a contact herbicide, and that means they would likely have to respray many more times, um, right, basically to the maximum number of times allowable on the label and they still would not get the control they were getting with glyphosate. So there is a chance banning glyphosate could result in putting more pesticide into the environment um, in some situations. So that's definitely one implication. Costs going up um, on vegetation management uh, being another major issue as many cities, municipalities have a specific budget um, that, they, that they apply and when they go away from the cheaper options, it greatly limits what they are capable of doing based upon a lack um, of uh, money available in the budget. So budgets are gonna have to change big time when you go away from glyphosate. Um, Ken gielli has got a nice uh, a blog that uh, Ken is one of our extension agents here in Florida, um, where he's uh, really addressed uh, this issue of human environmental risks of glyphosate and weed control. And so there's a link for that. Um, so vinegar concentration, this comes up as a really important issue. Uh, and so Barbara has suggested 30%. So commercial products are what, 19% or? 20. Oh yeah, 20 and higher. So commercial products are 20 and higher. Those vinegar products carry a danger signal word and they have extreme health risks for inhalation. And if you read the the, uh, the label for any of those commercial vinegar products, you have to be exceedingly careful. They also cause acute toxicity to a number of organisms in the environment. So if you spray them across frogs and lizards, you will kill them. There's an absolutely no question. It is an acid that you are spraying, acetic acid, and when it's concentrated, it's actually can be dangerous. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm saying educate yourself and don't take it lightly because at that concentration, it is a serious, pesticide. Um, how often is multiple? We dealt with that. Organic crops. How often is glyphosate used in organic crops? It's not going to be used in organic crops. Um, let's see, we talked about membership, key characteristics. We did that. Okay. Okay, those are all repeats. Okay. Um, straight white vinegar. Okay. Regular vinegar tends to be ineffective, so that's where you get into that 20% horticultural vinegar. Again, be very careful. Thank you, Lori, for uh, bringing that up again. Um, and there's also statements on birds and wildlife regarding acute issues and uh, do not apply around birds and wildlife. Okay, um, if it is used far away from edibles, should it be used? 
Okay, so glyphosate, uh, yes, glyphosate will have very specific um, language on each label for its, in terms of its use, both within cropping systems and independent of cropping systems. So read the label and it will be very clear on that. Um, any problem with putting a lot of vinegar and salt into the soil, changing the pH or salt content to the point where other plants might not grow? That is a possibility. And I think you could see some extremely localized pH changes uh, where you would be driving that pH downwards with the acid application. Um, to do that on a landscape scale would require a huge amount uh, of vinegar in a lot of uh, places, but it would depend upon the buffering capacity of your soils to be able to handle that acid input. So that's where you get a good soil scientist on board, uh, take a soil test uh, and to, to begin to understand what your buffering capacity is that's really going to affect the potential for pH shifts. Um, uh, do you know when it's applied to control aquatic weeds? Absolutely. So it's primarily applied for emergent aquatic weeds, so things that are growing up out of the water. It's not injected into the water column ever. It is only used for foliar application of above water plants, so it could be used for water hyacinth um, here in Florida, for emergence, for cattails across the country, for uh, phragmites, uh, uh, Austrian reed uh, grass, and uh, other emergence like that. Okay, there's another bleach thing. Again, gotta be careful with bleach. Negative uh, environmental, social, and economic impacts of glyphosate parts per hour. Ooh, that is a really, really busy question there. Um, and uh, that one is almost too much to get into. Economic wise, I've already talked a little bit about glyphosate's cheap, and if we shift other alternatives, there will be an economic cost, so you're going to have to be prepared for that. I'm not saying that's a terrible negative, but, uh, but it's something that you will have to address. Environmental wise, um, again, that's a very, a, a very deep topic. If you shifted to other herbicides that cause more environmental problems, that would be a bad thing. If you had to increase the area of available farmland, that would be taking natural areas, um, putting natural areas into production, which means you would be destroying native habitat. So that could be another trade-off associated with the glyphosate ban. Um, and these are things that, you know, you've, you've really got to weigh out. And so you, you have to sort of lay all these types of things out regarding, uh, you know, moving forward from that perspective. Um, Another effect of the lawsuits is an increase in price, and we talked about that, thank you. Current information on glyphosate's effect on bacteria in pollinator stomachs. Okay, Dr. Farrell, would you like to come in and briefly discuss that? So the question is about uh, the effect, impact of glyphosate on pollinator gut biome, basically. So there was a, a really strong paper published on this uh, about six months ago. And what they did is they put glyphosate in the sugar solution and put it on the hive. And they had several different concentrations of glyphosate. And what they found is when the bees were feeding on the, the higher levels of glyphosate uh, spiked sucrose, they did have, they did show signs of impact on their gut biome, their gut flora. However, there is good environmental quality data that has documented for many, many years how much glyphosate is traditionally found in the environment. So the amount of glyphosate that was impacting the bees was found to be higher than what has ever been found to occur in nature. So can glyphosate impact the gut flora of bees? It absolutely can, and that study documented it quite well, but it appears that it is unlikely to happen in normal or common scenarios because there's just not that much glyphosate loading that in the environment that the bee would commonly come in contact with. All right, let's see. Moving on here. So I'm gonna um, launch the poll really quick. This is just a few a few really fast questions, but you sure. can keep answering questions. It is four o'clock, but you're okay. welcome to stay on for a few minutes if you want to answer some more questions. Yeah, we're almost done here. So please fill out the poll here. Uh, this is extremely helpful um, in terms of IFAS programming and how we move forward in addressing things. I'm gonna pull this out of the way, but I will not close it. Um, okay, so additional questions. Uh, natural areas posting when they're gonna spray before, uh, after spraying event, uh, sometimes difficult to predict because of the weather. 
So certain herbicide labels do require natural area managers to actually post. A lot of municipalities have gone to online posting. And so if you're interested in this, then contact those people responsible for spraying and find out what they're doing. A lot of lakes will post notices before treatments. Um, so, you know, engage, engage with the, with, um, with the, your county city municipalities and find out uh, how to get information locally from them on when treatments are going to be going out. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, will the recording be available? Yes, I think so. Okay, vinegar. Okay, I eat vinegar on my salad. How bad can it be? Again, we mentioned not a problem with the stuff you buy in the grocery store, but when you get a 20% solution, 20% uh, concentration of vinegar, uh, that moves it into a pesticide category. 5% in the pantry. Yeah, that has significant problems. Okay. Um, what is specific glyphosate agricultural preparation used on sugar cane? So is glyphosate actually used on sugar cane? Do we have GMO sugar cane? No. No, we have no GMO sugar cane. So it would only be used in a pre-plant type situation, um, likely uh, prior to the planting. And uh, I don't know if it's used as a desiccant. I don't think so. Okay, corn gluten meal not recommended for use in Florida by Dr. Brian Unruh, who wrote his PhD thesis on the subject. 2% um, nitrogen and applications cannot be made during blackouts. Also, tend to get to get good weed control, you need to exceed label rates. Okay, so this is one where we have a national audience where corn gluten meal has been shown to be effective on certain species in other areas. Dr. Unruh, uh, professor here at, at UF, uh, has studied it extensively and has not found it to be as beneficial for weed control here in Florida. So again, could be locally useful for you, uh, perhaps in other states. Okay. Does it seep into, into edible garden if used away from it? Okay, so uh, excellent question there. Does glyphosate leach or move through the soil? Glyphosate is, if it is sprayed and reaches the soil, it is very tightly bound to soil particles. So there is a ton of that out there that does not, uh, or that shows that glyphosate does not leach or move laterally in the soil itself. So this is good news. So it stays where, you, where, where it's, it, it is applied. Um, in, in most cases uh, exclusively, you'd have to have a massive, massive thunderstorm, rainfall, flooding event to actually physically move the soil particles themselves to get glyphosate to, to be moved in that situation. Still not bioavailable. Yeah, however, it still would not be bioavailable to any of your edibles. So you could use it safely away from the garden and I would not have, I would not see any issues ever with any edible plant in your garden actually taking it up through the roots um, and, uh, and uh, concentrating it uh, in the plants, that would absolutely not happen. Um, even in pure sands, glyphosate still does not move. So here in Florida, even in very sandy areas, uh, which is most of the state, yeah, glyphosate is not gonna move into your gardens, which is a good thing. Okay, will salt dehydrate the roots of weeds and kill the root, even though you say it has contact only? In order to dehydrate them, it would have to physically move in and then would create a water potential uh, situation that prevented the roots from actually taking the water up. Um, so you would have literally created a beach environment in that case, or a uh, salt desert type environment where pretty much nothing would grow. Um, so. Uh, now salts will leach through the soil with rainfall and so that would be something you would have to repeatedly put out over and over and over to, to get that kind of activity. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, important to know the products. Yes, absolutely. If you're going to use glyphosate, you better know whether it's labeled for aquatic use or not. Many glyphosate products are not registered for use in aquatic settings. Do not ever use a Roundup product that is not labeled for aquatic use around aquatics. So just do not do it. Okay, how do the homemade control options affect microorganisms in the soil? Excellent question, not a lot of research there, but you can imagine putting an acid into the soil would likely shift the microfauna significantly with enough repeated applications. So you might go from a bacterial microfauna community to a fungal community with a pH shift, or you might go in the opposite direction, wiping out a lot of beneficial mycorrhizae. However, I am talking way beyond what we know data-wise there. That's speculation. So we need to be very careful in that. But right now, we just don't have a lot of good information there. 
Um, does it affect wildlife or friendly bugs? Okay, so does glyphosate? So there is toxicology testing the EPA requires regarding impacts, neg potential negative impacts on a number of wildlife species, on fish species, aquatic invertebrates, and the EPA has concluded that the risk of using glyphosate is, is acceptable in terms of minimal issues with a, a pretty broad range of organisms there. Monarch butterflies are gonna come up and we'll go ahead and address this question. Um, the issue of glyphosate has been linked by some researchers to declines in monarch butterflies. The best, the top monarch uh, folks in the world have basically, uh, 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 Dr. Agrawal from uh, University of Cornell has said it's not a uh, black and white answer and not a super clear answer. There are many factors affecting um, monarch butterfly declines right now. One thing is, um, historically, we, you know, we've always viewed uh, milkweeds, the, the food source for monarchs, as being weeds within agricultural settings. And we've kind of really, really pushed those things out of our, a lot of agronomic settings. I strongly advocate and encourage, you know, restoration of milkweed in natural areas pretty much everywhere it's native to. I think that's a great idea. Um, but in terms of what's going on within ag production areas, uh, we've been, you know, we've been uh, attacking milkweeds for much, much longer than glyphosate has ever been around. So in, in order to shift that, you would need a subsequent, sh a fundamental shift in our approach to agriculture and how you could figure out how to allow milkweeds to remain. And boy, that's a bigger discussion than we have time for today. Um, Kogon grass control. Okay, that's a whole nother topic, uh, Laura, and I would strongly encourage you to email that question, which can be forwarded to us, and we can provide you a tremendous amount of resources on that. Um, thank you for the compliment. Uh, yes, it is used in sugar cane to sweeten a 20% increase in sugar yield. Look it up. Okay, so someone is suggesting that uh, glyphosate is used as a, an actual sweetener. Um, within sugarcane. I'm not a sugarcane specialist, but I, I can actually reach out to our sugarcane people and confirm that for sure. Um, okay, uh, harvest on sugarcane, there you go. You got it, okay, Ron Rice is posting that. So, all right, thank you, Ron. Um, labeled as Reitman Sugarcane Stewart. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, Nancy too, thank you all uh, for that. Um, how soluble the chemicals? Okay, so, um, that's a great question. So when, when let's just limit this to glyphosate. When glyphosate is, is uh, makes it into a water source, yeah, it's soluble in the water, but it's gonna be rapidly bound to any organic matter within that water column and immediately deactivated so that uh, it would not be effective on controlling things. Uh, then it's environmental fate. It's uh, broken down by microorganisms which latch onto it when it's bound to organic matter and begin to break it apart. Um, yeah, okay, we got to wrap it up here. So, um, bee gut, I uh, just talked about bee gut. Uh, Dr. Farrell, Jason Farrell, uh, is, is Dr. Farrell, uh, let's see, Gloves, okay, we got that. Uh, similar lecture on GMO and Roundup Ready crops. Oh boy. So, I just, you know, um, Shelly can take that into consideration and possibly inviting some speakers to address that topic. Here's our contact information SFNLO and Jay Farrell at ufl.edu. And uh, thank you for all the excellent questions there. Uh, we are really appreciative of, of, of the uh, interest here. And again, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us, to Shelly, to your local IFAS uh, extension agent.